visions in his hand Who has numbered every grain of sand Kings and nations tremble at his voice All creation rises to rejoice Behold a God seated on his throne Come let us adore him Behold a King Nothing can compare Come let us adore Well, good evening, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this special mental health, mental health panel discussion. My name is Garrett Haley, coming to you from Texas, and it is such an honor to be here with you all today. Welcome to this panel discussion. We're so glad that you are here. As you probably well know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and perhaps more so now than ever, this is such an important discussion to have. We are all fresh off the heels of a very difficult pandemic and just there have never been more opportunities to be stressed and anxious. And so it is such an honor and privilege to be able to discuss this important topic today. Just to paint some statistics of this, uh, of this topic, the World Health Organization estimates that 260 million people around the world suffer from some form of depression. Here in the US where I live, about 40 million adults suffer from anxiety. And it's actually the most common mental health illness here in the United States. 
And even though this is sometimes a, uh, an easily treatable condition, only about one third of people actually seek medical health. Medical help. So we're very excited today to dive into this important topic, and we're so glad that you are here as well. You know, as Christians, we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And so it is very honoring to him to think about health, to think about our minds, to think about how can we honor him in the way that we treat our minds and the way that we um, help other people. So today we're going to dive into some very good questions about this. What questions like, um, is mental health a spiritual issue? Is it a sign of weak faith if somebody is struggling with depression? What does it look like for a church to helpfully treat others through mental health? And uh, we're going to hear from some wonderful panelists today on, on these, these important questions. Just before we dive into the um, panelist bios, just a quick couple of logistical notes. This, of course, is being streamed live on YouTube. And so if you happen to miss part of the discussion today, don't worry. It will be saved as a YouTube video on the But God blog YouTube page. And we'd also love to hear feedback and follow-up questions. If you have any thoughts or questions that arise from today's discussion, feel free to shoot those over to info at butgod.net. That's info at butgod.net. I'm going to now introduce each of the panelists, and then we will have an opening prayer and kick off our discussion today. Our first panelist is Dr. Ashok Chako. He is the director of the Biblical Counseling Trust of India. Um, Dr. Shook is a community health physician who has worked for many years in rural areas of North India. He is committing to helping those with mental health struggles, as well as training pastors and lay leaders in biblical counseling. Our next panelist is Dr. Raja Palraj. He is a medical doctor, psychiatrist, and counselor based in India. He works as a consultant psychiatrist and counselor at a mission hospital as well as a staff care consultant for the International Justice Mission. He is passionate about equipping the faith-based community to care for those who are suffering, especially with mental illness. Our third panelist is Sarah Prabhakar Rufus. She completed her studies in psychology as well as theology in both Australia and the US. Her work is primarily in the areas of child and family counseling. Back in 2014, she returned to India, where she joined the team at BCTI, which is the Biblical Counseling Trust of India, and she continues to serve with them today. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Dr. Scott Schiffer is a uh, fellow Texan. He uh, has a PhD in Christian theology and currently serves as program director of Christian leadership postgraduate studies at Criswell College here in Texas in Dallas. He has a heart for helping believers draw closer to God and for aiding them as they're faced with new challenges every day. So thank you to each of our four panelists for being here today. Looking forward to a wonderful discussion with you all. Before we begin our questions, um, Dr. Shiver, would you mind committing our time to the Lord? Yes. God, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak about this important issue. And we ask you to open the hearts of those that are listening and those that are watching. Help them to feel your conviction of um, maybe things that are going on in their life that cause anxiety, depression, or other issues. We also ask you to help them to feel conviction as to whether or not people that they know and people that they are um, in contact with are struggling and give them a heart to just reach out and help those people uh, as many people who are struggling just need help. We thank you for the opportunity today, for the time, and we ask you just to be with each of the panelists as they um, share from their hearts about the different questions will be asked. And we ask you, Lord, just to give us wisdom uh, to, to say things that are uplifting to the church and helpful for the community. It's in your son's name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Schiffer. We're going to start off with just a few questions about the status quo, kind of the situation we find ourselves in as Christians with mental health. And uh, Scott, this first question is actually directed to you. Um, you know, as believers, there's often a concern about not wanting to be too affected by cultural trends and things going on in the culture today. And so um, we want to be careful not to be swept away by fads and things like that. So Dr. Schiffer, do you think is the church being swept away by another trend in the world and talking about this popular topic of, of mental health? You know, I don't think that it's just a trend as legitimate health issues are nothing new. But what does seem trendy is that if people look hard enough, they can find some kind of mental health disorder for virtually 
anything they want to correspond it with. In other words, it could be used as a crutch for some uh, to perhaps avoid growing as a person or perhaps uh, as a crutch to keep from having to become responsible in a certain area of life. And while that's the case, I don't think that's the case in the majority of situations. In fact, um, I think it's important to note that we now live in a world where people have the opportunity to get the mental and emotional help that they need. Uh, perhaps a number of years ago before uh, modern psychology really became a studied topic, um, you know, people understood that individuals had struggles and had issues, but there wasn't the same kind of help. And with the way the world worked in general, people didn't have the same kind of time or resources to devote to getting the kind of help that they need. So I think we're very blessed to live in an age where people uh, study this kind of stuff and where those who need help can get help if they seek it out. I think the real situation uh, that we need to keep in mind here, or the real you know, focus for this, is that people have to be willing to seek the help out. And if we are villainizing mental health, or if we are making people feel less adequate or less valuable because they are in need of mental health help, uh, they're going to be less likely to seek it out. And so one of the things we really need to do as a church is to um, just be willing to uh, encourage people to go and get the help that they need and let them know we're there to support them in that, we're there to help them in that, and we want this for them because we want what's best for them as valuable people. Hmm. Thank you, Scott. Just as we begin to lay the groundwork for today's discussion, um, I know speaking for me and probably many of us on the on the video, um, on watching the video, we don't have much of a, uh, a very deep understanding of what exactly is mental health. So Dr. Raj, could you help us just um, understand what would you say is an accurate definition of mental health? And more specifically, at what point can something be properly classified as a mental health issue that needs to be taken seriously and perhaps seek some of the treatment that Scott was discussing? And we'll ask this to you, Dr. Raj, and then uh, Sarah, if you'd like to provide any follow-up comments, you're more than welcome to. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, <clears throat> so we're gonna um, see, let's say maybe three things to understand um, the, the answer. You know, one is the mental health and then the second is the mental illness or mental disorder. And then we invite scripture to, you know, expand our view on, on those two things. Um, if you see the uh, World Health Organization, uh, the definition, um, it says, you know, the state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities can cope up with the normal stress of life and can work productively, fruitfully, and is able to make contribution to uh, his or her community. So it just focuses on the subjective well-being, self-efficacy, you know, autonomy, competence, and um, uh, self-actualization. Uh, but it's also bring the community, uh, making those connections. So even you know, for in midst of uh, COVID, um, right now um, I may be feeling, you know, day uh, sad, but that doesn't mean that I have a mental uh, disorder. Um, so uh, so we need to understand. Uh, the the it's it's going to occur in the continuum of uh, what I'm feeling today, uh, sad or uh, you know depressed or uh, low mood. It doesn't mean that I have a mental health issue. Um, so, so that's that's very important for us to understand. The the second, um, you know, uh, let's let's imagine if I stop talking or eating, uh, you know, I suddenly uh, lost my interest in talking with my wife, my kids. I am withdrawn, um, let's say not for one or two days, but uh, more than a week, uh, more than two weeks, more than a month. Then, then at this point, we are functionally, what we are looking at is a functional disability. So at this point, we say there is a mental uh, disorder has occurred. It's like, uh, you know, I have a pain in my bone versus I have a broken bone. Um, uh, so let's use some words to, uh, you know, understand this. Um, so it can, we can say sad mood, but that's not what it is. It's unusually sad mood and uh, excessive fear or worry. Uh, so uh, when we talk about unusual and excessive, we are talking about something which is affecting our function. Um, 
but but let's see um, you know the third point is let's let's hear from um, harvard uh, psychopathologist richard mcnally what he says is there is a range of human emotions and struggles uh, that is considered normal mental illness occurs on a continuum he says uh, with no clear natural boundary between a non disorder and disorder so so it's important for us to know that there is a continuum uh, from the distress to disorder so we won't we won't sometime we won't be able to say here is the day it all started okay uh, but but we let's invite scripture to tell us a little bit more uh, we are not when we talk about mental health uh, we are focused on mind you know or brain um, but scripture gives us the richer view of what is mental health mental illness under the broader category of suffering and it engages with a person you know our life uh, it doesn't look at me as a diagnosis it look at me, looks at me as a person and uh, my life mediated through brain through heart so the primary focus is uh, as a person so person living in a personal interpersonal universe as a god related being so that is where scripture kind of expands the view from mental health mental disorder to look at us as this uh, person living in god's environment Um, I think it's over to me. I don't think I have that much more to say because Raja has just laid a really helpful foundation. But to pick up on maybe two things to say that um, if we're looking at mental health as a form of suffering, um, Scripture tells us that all of suffering is, is important to God and therefore is important to one another. Like he cares about our suffering. And so we want to care about one another's suffering. And if we're remembering the continuum that, that Raja was saying, it means that we can identify and understand maybe we haven't had the exact same experience as someone else, but because we may have had anxiety before an exam, we have a sense of anxiety that someone may be experienced that is more prolonged, that is um, covering more of life. Um, and it can be for many different things like sadness or or grief or different things, but it gives us an opportunity to be a part of um, one another's experiences um, and to be sharing that together. Thank you both. Dr. Ashok, we'll, we'll give you a chance to answer this, this next question. Um, I think Scott kind of alluded to it, but there is sometimes this, this unfortunate stigma in Christian circles about seeking help for medical, medical health. So do you think Dr. Shook, is there a need for churches to have more open discussions on mental health? Do you have any thoughts or intuitions on that? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, as Scott has mentioned that, you know, mental health issues, you, he mentioned statistics, is going to affect a major portion of the world in the 21st century is going to be affected by mental health, you know, depression, suicide, and so on. In fact, that may be one of the le leading causes of uh, illness in the 21st century. So the whole population is going to be affected and therefore the church is also going to be affected. Now, in India at least, we don't have enough mental health professionals to deal with the numbers. There's one psychiatrist for more than a lack of people, 100,000 people, you know. So, and besides that, we don't have as many counselors as well. So how are you going to handle it? And this is where there is a role for the church as well, to uh, become open about it, to talk about it. Uh, as you mentioned very clearly, there's always been a stigma about mental health. Uh, so people uh, don't like to talk about it and they hide it till it becomes uh, so difficult that it becomes a problem for people or they keep away from others when the issues are there. So when pastors are able to talk about it and share openly about these issues that people also will, they, they can create a safe environment where people feel uh, safe enough to share their struggles so that they can be handled early enough uh, and it won't become a major problem. And therefore it's very important for churches to move in that direction uh, so that, um, you know, there's much more possibility within the church because we are a group of people all committed to one another and to the Lord. Uh, we can help those who are struggling. And of course, it also means that we have to take away this 
attitude of looking down on people or judging people because of mental health issues you know the in the past they always thought of categories of mad and normal and uh, hopefully now we're not going to use such terminology uh, and classify people like that uh, and understand that uh, as raja mentioned that we are all sufferers we we suffer in d- different degrees and when you look at a, men, a person who is suffering with mental health issues you can look at him with more compassion and therefore compassion is something that churches should be having both in the church and outside for others thank you dr ashok our next set of questions regards scripture and how we can learn about mental health from scripture or if that is if that is a good strategy um Dr. Raj, we'll point this first question to you, sir. Um, you know, many people, including non-Christians, turn to the Bible for help and advice on a variety of issues. Do you think that is mental health one of them? H- have you found instances in Scripture where there are helpful verses that discuss mental health? or um, And if so, what, what, what do they say? Um, uh, Garrett, it's, it's going to be a uh, it, it's going to be yes and no. Uh, let me let me explain the no first. Uh, Bible does not talk about mental health by exclusively using, you know, the clinical terminologies um, or a diagnostic labels. It doesn't say uh, here is a depression and here is a five symptoms. Here is anxiety, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. So because Bible is not a diagnostic manual or a psychiatric textbook, so we cannot expect uh, that to happen there. Or it doesn't, uh, neither it doesn't, t- you know, tell us uh, which medicine to take, uh, which kind of counseling to uh, use. But Bible talks about mental health. I'm coming to the next answer. Yes, Bible talks about mental health. But when it talks about mental health under the you know the generic category of uh, heart, uh, it talks about as I was telling earlier. It ta- it talks about us as a person. So it doesn't compartmentalize our mind uh, and say here is a mind, here is a brain. But rather, it gives a very robust view of connecting our heart to the body and society and family. So it, it gives us a little, you know, it's like a, it's like you are putting extra lenses in your, you know, binocular or just seeing more clearly. So it talks about uh, in clarity, in length, about interpersonal, intrapersonal, you know, the body related weakness, how they influence our heart and our emotions. You know, our heart is a seat where emotions and feelings and volitions are all coming out. So uh, in that way, yes, it talks about, uh, uh, you know, mental health in, in, a, in a detailed way. And it gives us importance to human emotions. I, I'm, I'm very uh, just uh, uh, taken up by Psalms. I use Psalms in my counseling um, every day. And, um, and I see, uh, you know, the Psalms is the third largest book by word count. And uh, the third largest book in the Bible has given so much space for human emotions. And uh, here is David, the psalmist is, you know, telling he's lonely, he's happy, he's uh, struggling with the trust, he's losing hope. So uh, the heart, feelings, you know, everything is captured. Let, just for a time's sake, I'm going to just uh, talk about a few psalms and show, you know, how, how the psalms are capturing our emotions and uh, our feelings. Here is Psalm 143. Okay. And let's see some verse 4. It says, uh, my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. And then he says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thirsty. And he's talking, answer me quickly. I'm, I'm you know, it's a, a kind of anxiety. I cannot just wait for a long time. And then Psalm 77. I have read Psalm 77 with many patients. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out, uh, you know, my hands. And uh, imagine a man whole night stretching out his hand without being comforted. For me, that that's, looks like a person who is struggling with anxiety and depression. But it doesn't tell. Here is David. He's anxious or depressed. But on the other side, you know, he's, he talks about, I'm groaning. I am, I am, my spirit is faint. What he's telling, I'm tired. My eyes, I'm unable to sleep. There is a sleep disturbance. Uh, in another place, actually, David says, my bones are dry. Uh, they're like a physiological symptoms. So Bible does not just say here is a mind, here is a symptom, but it expands, takes it and expands to connect our body and mind. Okay. And we are all going through grief nowadays. Um, you know, I, I read Psalm 88 with a few of uh, the COVID-19, uh, the second wave, uh, some of my friends, you know, it says you have taken 
uh, from me my closest friends even grief uh, is addressed there and i can find my story my struggle in scripture uh, that's the beauty of uh, you know finding ourselves my story is there then not only that uh, many years ago when i was doing psychiatry i was reading cognitive behavior therapy at the same time i was reading psalm 139 i was really stunned by the way scripture came to me uh, it was so clear uh, that uh, here is here is here is a clear view of how i can analyze my automatic thoughts i'm i'm just reading last two verses of psalm 139 um, again i have read this uh, verse with uh, many of my clients who struggle with anxiety to help them to invite god to search their heart it says search me o god and know my heart search me and know my know my anxious thoughts he he's very clear here you know um, he talks about god coming to uh, search uh, uh, his thoughts so so kind of uh, how do we understand overall uh, bible talks about uh, our, our suffering in a you know mental health in a broader category of, category of suffering and it's a very comprehensive understanding it talks about the personal god and to our personal brokenness and there is a personal word and there is a personal communication you know we are talking to god god is talking to us and then inviting us to talk to others so there is a lot of things are packed here i can i can go on uh, to find you know this this uh, it just like a mining experience as you as you read every day you see this uh, amazing um, you know scripture comes alive to us to talk about our suffering and mental health in that Thank you, Raja. Great, great word. It's, it is encouraging to see all the emotions in the Psalms. It's, a, it's an amazing treasure trove, as you said. Um, Sarah, we'll, we'll, we'll ask this next question of you. I know you've spent time in the U.S. You've lived here for a bit, studying here. Um, there was an interesting study that came out that said about 35% of Americans think that Bible reading and prayer are sufficient to tackle mental health issues. So there's a sense that if we if we pray and if we read our, our Bibles, then that will solve our mental health problems. Do you think that is a, a fair view of, of, of the best way to think about this? Or, or do you think otherwise? And then Dr. Shook, if you'd like to add on to what Sarah says, feel free to do so. Um, that statistic kind of surprises me in some ways. Um, but I guess I can see how we just often want um, someone to tell us what to do or give us a formula, tell me what to read, tell me what to pray, and then everything will be okay. And I think um, we, we kind of just have that desire, we're ready to do something, but can you tell us what to do? Um, but when it comes to like answering this specific question of is Bible reading, is prayer sufficient to you know solve our problems or help us with mental health struggles? Um, I think one thing that's really important to remember is that we we're not alone in this and, and God calls us to be in community with others. So um, when we're not struggling on our own God, his name, Emmanuel, he is with us and, uh, and we need each other. We are a body. Um, there's different portions of scripture that talk about the body, whether that be Romans 12 or Ephesians 4 um, and looking at how the body feels with one another. It's picking up on different things that we've talked about. But uh, let me give a practical example of this. My, my grandmother, she passed away a couple of years ago, but she had dementia. So she had a, a weakness of her mind and, and that memory loss did increase as she, as she grew older. And we had to move her into a nursing home. And, and look, I would say definitely God's grace, she wasn't there for too long. He called her home. Um, but she didn't know this new place. It was unfamiliar. And there was no way that she was going to learn this new home because of the struggle with dementia. And we would have to say to her, Grandma, do you trust me? You know me, do you trust me? This, this is home for now. And it wasn't always easy, but um, there was a sense of she did. She would look at us. Yes, I know you and I trust you. I know you're not going to do anything bad to me. Um, and so there are times that we, I mean, that's a very, um, I guess, vivid example of needing someone else or needing another person. But yeah, we, we have one another. So um, I think scripture points us to one another because we could be 
reading our Bible on, on our own. We could be praying on our own, but we're, we're called to do that actually in community and to help one another along the way. And I guess the other aspect is that we are applying what we're reading um, and we're praying as we live it out. So um, we could stay inside on our own reading and praying, but unless we are in situations where we are, um, I guess, being tested, we could put it that way, where we are able to, to grow and to, to see. So um, like if we are anxious about, uh, I guess, crowds, for example, maybe everyone's anxious about crowds right now because of COVID, but um, unless we go into situations and practice what we are applying in scripture, what we're praying with the help of other people, um, we're not going to see that change or that growth that's taking place. Um, so I would say, yes, scripture, prayer, it's foundational and um, it's beyond us, which is such a wonderful thing. It's God's work that is not just reliant on my efforts, um, but um, there's, there's more to it than that. Um, I hope that's a helpful start. Um, I will share about uh, a patient whom I counseled. She was a strong believer and uh, but she was suffering from depression and when i was counseling her i was amazed at the number of verses she could quote to me uh, from scripture about being don't be afraid fear not and all that so she knew scripture by heart yet she was struggling with this whole issue of depression and uh, it took two or three sessions with her to help her to understand uh, application of scripture in our own heart uh, to tackle some of the issues that she had, she was facing uh, and then to help her to get out of it. So just to add on to what Sarah is saying, scripture and prayer are definitely number one where we should all go to that. But when people are struggling sometimes, uh, they need somebody else to come along, a, a good biblical counselor, a pastor or some people would require mental health professionals to come along. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Kind of to piggyback off what you just said, um, I wonder, you know, this is a question for you, Dr. Raj, at, if a Christian does have serious mental health um, issues that sort of meet some of the criteria we were discussing a few minutes ago, would you, would you recommend that they seek biblical counseling first or professional help? And, and I know you mentioned you, you've had counseling experience in the past with a lot of different people. And I guess another question that's kind of related to that would be at what point should we, um, or should elders and mentors encourage the flock to their churches to seek medical help if they are struggling with some of these, um, some of these mental health concerns? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a very important question. Um, first, can a Christian get depressed? Yes. Um, I can I can get depressed tomorrow, and and I can develop schizophrenia, um, just like uh, you know as I was giving this example, my bone uh, can you know it, it experience brokenness in the same way, um, I my mind also can experience. So that's that's a very important thing for all of us to understand. You know the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon, he he himself has gone through uh, depression. If you if we read the you know his early part of his biography is a lot of uh, depression, the content, even he says those things. So, uh, so that's very important for all of us to understand. So we are not, uh, you know, um, uh, resisting or saying it won't happen. So just like cough and cold, I can, uh, mental health issues are uh, common and can happen too. The second issue is um, anyone with mental health needs, uh, you know, um, uh, from common mental health issues like um, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, um, to severe mental health issues like, you know, bipolar or um, psychotic disorder or schizophrenia. We all need help. So that's the second important thing that we need to understand. The word help is in capital letter in our mind, H-E-L-P. We all need help. As you know, earlier Sarah was telling, we are all needy uh, as much as we are needed. And then uh, the problem is often people struggle in silence or in isolation because of stigma and lack of knowledge about mental illness. We have already, you know, we are tracing the theme throughout uh, our talk. Uh, there is a stigma. Uh, and then 
it's very important now we are talking about biblical counseling and then we are talking about professional help and uh, as 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 a you know i'm a biblical counselor but i am also a professional um, uh, you know in treating mental health issues so i in my mind i don't see that as a two different entity but for our audience i'm going to answer that uh, clearly one is uh, you know when we talk about biblical counseling it is not that we are going to just give a verse to read or just pray that has been a common uh, confusion uh, when we talk about biblical counseling we are talking about trained uh, professionals trained people in you know trained in the discipline of understanding various categories of mental health issues understanding various categories of interpretation uh, and then how to you know uh, help from scripture so that is what we are talking about biblical counselor when we say uh, where to go so uh, as a biblical counselor we are all wise and skillful helper so whether if we have a common mental health issues or a severe mental health issues if there is availability that you can go to a biblical counselor a trained biblical counselor who knows uh, what is mental illness uh, you know when to refer uh, all those things so uh, you can you can go and approach and it is quite common actually in developing world uh, there are studies shows that many of the people who actually they don't go to professional help they actually go to the pastors or the imams or um, uh, you know the Hindu priest. So in that way, you are you are a biblical counselor. You are there. Uh, if you are a pastor trained in biblical counseling, probably you will be seeing more people than a psychiatrist um, in your in your life experience. Second, uh, the aspect of professional help. When we talk about professionals, we are talking about again the trained uh, counselors, psychologists, psychotherapists, nurse, psychiatrist, nurse, psychiatrist, social workers, and psychiatrists like me. So when a, when a person need help, uh, let's say for a, per, a person need uh, like a, going through psych, psychosis, acute psychosis, he's hearing voices, uh, he's not sleeping, he's very disturbed. At the time, if you don't have a you know professional uh, you know, biblical counselors to go, it's important that you need to go any available helper, whether even if it is your primary doctor, it's important to go to the primary doctor because. Dr. Ashok Chakra was telling earlier, um, countries like India, uh, we have one psychiatrist actually for 200,000 population and uh, for a whole country of 1.3 billion, we have 4,500 psychiatrists and uh, that is like um, 30,000 psychiatrists less according to WHO. I'm talking about a pre-COVID uh, situation. And that is what, uh, uh, you know, WHO calls this as a mental health gap but uh, i call this as a gospel gap uh, because we need more helpers there are so much need but we need more helpers so for example uh, you know if you are a church member uh, if you are in a, you know in india you would like to get trained uh, to understand mental health issues and uh, maybe you can contact bcti there are a lot of uh, you know ch uh, courses for churches um, let me let me t tell us uh, like a, just a quick story uh, where this biblical counseling and you know, professional help come together. I was working in another smaller uh, mission hospital in the valley. Um, and um, this pastor, he earlier, he used to just, uh, uh, let's say, uh, pray, only pray or cast out demons. Uh, that was his mode of operation when it comes to mental health issues. And he started attending a lot of our training programs. He understood what is biblical counseling is. He understood what uh, is, uh, you know, psychosis, mental health. Then uh, one day he came in contact with a patient uh, who delivered a baby recently and that uh, that patient developed postpartum psychosis. And uh, he even understood the term when he gave me a call. He said, Dr. Raja, I have a patient. I have a lady with uh, psychosis. He didn't even know what exactly to say. She's hearing voices. She's running around. And uh, that pastor brought the uh, they are from a snake charmer family nearby. And they brought the whole 15 people to our ER. And uh, then this lady, uh, uh, he, he brought the lady to the ER. We admitted her, we treated her. And the whole church looked after this lady for f uh, almost 10 days, fed this family three times, uh, looked after their children. They even brought uh, a nursing mother from the church to feed uh, you know, the baby of this uh, uh, woman who struggled with psychosis. 
when i saw that picture in the hospital i was thinking wow the, the, here is here is this professional help interacting with uh, the biblical counseling and benefiting uh, this group of people otherwise you know she will be still going to different faith healers so my advice is uh, please seek help wherever the help is available and uh, please seek help uh, when there is a uh, training trained people are around you and if you are interested get trained so you can help others uh, so be a helper uh, that is where uh, uh, you know i'm going to end thank you raja great great story uh, scott i'd like to tee up this next question to you with with a bit of a personal illustration i have uh, two friends and one of them is quite uh, vocal about his struggles with depression and i have another friend who has never put it this way but i've realized he does struggle with schizophrenia and it's just fascinating to see the different i guess degrees of, of familiarity or stigma even with those two different mental health conditions um, there's sort of seems to be a spectrum where something like schizophrenia is a little bit more extreme and might be viewed in some circles as a punishment from god whereas something like depression is more mainstream and more more familiar. And so there's not so much of a stigma with that one. Uh, sometimes we, we of course, we know that all of these are a fallout from a broken world. But um, how would you respond to somebody who would suggest that those might be specific um, punishments from God for our sins? Is there some sort of relationship we should be aware of between mental health illnesses and sin? And um, I love also Dr. Raj, hear your thoughts on this, if, if you'd like to add in. You know, I think that some mental health issues are more prevalent, and so we feel like we understand them more. As a result, they become more acceptable to us, uh, whereas mental health issues with fewer people being affected, uh, they become more alarming to us because we don't understand them. People always tend to fear what they don't understand, and because of that, um, certain health issues do carry a stigma, and in the case of your friends, I can certainly see why someone with sort of like a schizophrenia type issue is gonna be much less likely to be open about that than someone with depression because everywhere you look, people are struggling with depression. Uh, I think that people also have a harder time opening up about anxiety, but um, I, I feel like that's because they're anxious about how people are going to respond to knowing that they have anxiety. And so uh, it sort of makes sense that it sort of goes hand in hand with that particular uh, mental health concern. That being said, we uh, sometimes get this idea in our mind that God's punishing us uh, for sins and afflicting us with these mental health issues because of things that we've done. And perhaps we look at the book of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, who uh, clearly had some kind of a mental health issue where he went and lived out in a field for a year. And, um, you know, that's, that's very likely the case in his specific situation. But I think more often than not, that's not the case at all. And when we look at the Gospels, in John chapter 9, there is a blind man who uh, is brought before Jesus. And the people ask Jesus, did he sin or did his parents sin that caused this ailment with him? And while blindness isn't really a mental health issue, um, you know, the, the common thought was, essentially, if there's something wrong with you, it's because of sin. And Jesus says, neither one sinned. And the result of him being this way is to prove the power of God. And so when we look at scripture on the whole, we find people struggling and suffering throughout scripture. And many times their struggling is not related to any sin that they have committed. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, in our own world, um, I think that we, we really need to, um, to grapple with the idea that more often than not, mental health problems are a result of trauma that we experience. And trauma we experience is something that typically happens to us. We may have facilitated the trauma, but um, things in trauma are out of our control. And when we um, experience things that are out of our control, sometimes the damage that's done uh, inhibits our ability to uh, either have some kind of a mental block where we can't think and move past something or it creates some kind of an emotional block or even it, it you know, sort of just cripples us. Um, one of the 
um, counseling professors at the college where I teach at um, has talked to me on a number of occasions about people with depression feeling like they are in their own prison of pain and that they can't get out of that prison and there's nothing they can do to make that go away. And for them, especially as they lean more towards suicide or suicidal tendencies and thoughts, uh, they f begin to think the best thing that could happen to me to stop all this would just for me to not be here anymore. And that's, a, that's sort of, you know, obviously that's wrong headed, it's a wrong way of thinking, but they're in such a damaged state because of the trauma they've experienced because of what's happening to them that they don't even realize the error in the way that they're thinking. And so uh, I would argue that sin is not typically uh, the reason why we, um, or rather punishment for sin is not the reason why we have mental health concerns. I do think you can argue that mental health concerns are a result of living in a fallen world. You know, in the garden, Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit. And it says that all of creation became corrupt at that point. And because creation became corrupt, things don't function as they should. And because things don't function as they should, things in our world are not the way that they need to be. And our brains don't work as they need to. Our emotions don't always work as they need to. Our physical bodies don't always work as they, as they need to. And even our relationships with other people don't work as they need to. And so uh, you can say that mental health issues and concerns are a result of living in a fallen world. But I don't think it's a wise decision to say that uh, you have these mental health concerns because of your sin. I also really think of, uh, in this situation, Paul and his thorn in the flesh, right? And so in 2 Corinthians uh, 12, I believe, he talks about having a thorn in his flesh. And it says, I prayed for God to remove it. And I prayed for God to remove it. And he just didn't do it. And so then he said, I just had to learn to essentially live with this struggle that I'm having. Now, we don't know what that struggle is. People have um, postulated about it. it could be this or this or this. But I mean, honestly, there's nothing in scripture that gives any kind of indication of what it is. So I don't think that's really worth our time. But for many people that I know who struggle with depression, I've heard them say, I've prayed for God to take this away from me. Uh, I've, you know, with anxiety, I've prayed for God to remove this and he hasn't done it. And so then the question becomes, why hasn't God taken this away? Does God want me to suffer? Uh, or a question becomes, you know, is God really there? And uh, these are valid questions because we're trying to make sense of our reality. Um, but another potential, uh, you know, thing is that, hey, you know, uh, as I think uh, someone, maybe Raja mentioned this earlier, uh, you know, God is with us in our suffering. And if you look at the Psalms, you see that repeatedly with David, you're there with me in my hour of despair. And while, um, you know, some people may struggle because of specific sins they've committed, more often than not, people are struggling because of trauma they've experienced. And what they need to know is even if God doesn't take that away through praying or through reading scripture, um, he's still there with us and walking with us throughout that process. There's a song that uh, I like that came out a few years ago called Hospital for Sinners. And it talks about how the church should be like a hospital for sinners, a place where people can go to find healing for all the things that are plaguing them in life. And part of being able to go to church and openly talk about your mental health concerns is that you can help, uh, help one another and you can find healing together. And I think if we were more open in our churches, we would even recognize that more people struggle than we're even aware of. And until we get to the point where we can openly share and say, hey, look, I've got that same problem over here. We may not experience it exactly the same because everyone's personal experiences are their own. Uh, but there's, there's a bit of community building that needs to be done around mental health concerns and struggles uh, that allow us to heal together. And I think the church is a great place to do that. But we can't, as a church, look at people and go, that guy has anxiety, he must be sinning, he must be doing something outside God's will, and so instead of helping him, we're going to condemn him and shun him. As a church, we just can't think that way. It's, it's not appropriate. Uh, what we need to do instead is say, this person is, is a valuable human being created in the image of God. He's got a problem, and we as a church need to help him. We need to reach out and uh, lift him up in his struggle. 
Scott, thanks for that. Was uh, that was really wonderful uh, what you said. Um, just just the story of uh, the blind man. Uh, that's where I, I often go to. You know, when I get this question often, uh, even in the clinic, um, uh, because I work with a lot of Christian community and churches here, um, and I often ask them, "What about common cold and sin? Um, what about that? And what about cancer and sin? And you know." Um, blood blood disorder and sin so uh because we don't understand there is there is uh this is a complex what we are dealing when it comes to mental health is a complex issue and we try to give an, a simple answer to a complex issue that is where this reductionistic approach of uh, you know just correlating sin to suffering or sin to mental health um uh, i i kind of often see that as a uh, poor view of god and also you know if you have to take it a little further poor view of theology of suffering um we need to have a whole what scripture talks about you know if, if again scott mentioned psalms if we go to romans 5 it talks about suffering there is a pathway how suffering leads to hope so when we talk about mental health it's it's not it is a suffering and how we can gain hope that is where scripture is focusing jesus is focusing uh, so we also need to focus there and and the other thing is um, i work in a in a mountain community here i i it's I, I see not only this question comes from christians but i also see you know many uh, uh, other people from other faith like hindus coming and telling presenting with the depression and um, particular man comes to uh, comes to my mind right now this man has already offered six goats to his village goddess um, and uh, he he still thinks uh, the goddess has not forgiven him because he has committed some sin so so it's not only in 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 the in some uh, christian circle but it's also very prevalent in other faith um, so that we need to understand this kind of this work based theology poor theology of suffering is is a kind of the root cause of this kind of correlation then uh, we also kind of you know see the sin um, uh, and the psychopathology like uh, how how do we are how are we making this connection for that uh, you know I, again you know i was asking cold common cold and sin um, thyroid thyroid disorders if i have a low thyroid and i can feel weird and i can actually develop depression so uh, again we need to expand that's where scripture i feel comes alive uh, to call us as this embodied soul this body and soul being uh, you know sarah was talking about alzheimer's and uh, people forget things and say you know uh, weird things uh, when they go through alzheimer's so our brain injury so we, we need to uh we need to take this um not this one factor consideration reductionistic view we need to have a view of christ here so we don't just correlate sin and mental illness and a complex issue offering a simple solution um so uh it's it's very important for us to understand uh that as believers as scott was giving his call uh let's not let's not uh, correlate but let's keep an open arm to invite people to our church thank you raja i love all of your real life stories and examples those are very very helpful in thinking about all this um sarah i don't know about in india but here in the u.s for sure there's a there's an idea that we call the prosperity gospel that's pretty popular it, it's the idea that if we follow the lord and if we obey him then essentially life will be very rosy and we'll have wealth and health and good success in life and even for those of us who completely reject that idea um, it can still be very disorienting and demoralizing when we are seeming to walk with the lord but still struggling with mental health or or some of these um, uh, some of these disorders so do you think is it possible for someone who does have a strong faith and who's walking with the lord to struggle with mental health or how would you respond to somebody who who raises that question um, it's a question that I, I think counselees have had when I've been talking with them, um, just even general conversations, the idea that as, as a believer, as a Christian, we should feel happy all the time. Um, I, I have been in church when people have said, you know, hands up if you're happy today and everyone's raising up their hands. And I just, I'm kind of squirming at that point in time because I think, Scripture doesn't tell us anything about 
um, that we should be feeling happy um, all the time. It talks about rejoicing in all circumstances, but we understand rejoicing as a much deeper, um, I guess, emotion. Um, it's about our relationship with the Lord. Um, it's not about our outward circumstances. And I think that's a lot of what um, Paul is getting at at the end of uh, Philippians, Philippians 4, when he says, I've learnt uh, to, to be content uh, in both good circumstances and bad circumstances. In that same passage, he's talking about rejoicing and calling us to rejoice. So um, just coming back to kind of where, like that question of um, can we have weak faith um, or is that the reason for struggles that we're having um, of the mind or, or in any other sort of situation? No, an absolute no. <laughs> um, I think um, as counsellors, we love the Psalms. Um, Raja has mentioned about the Psalms um, a few times already, but uh, the Psalms give a realness and a rawness of life and the expression of that. That I think is there in a few other portions of scripture, but in such a full way. And it's the, it's the full range of emotions too. It's, it's the sadness, it's the lowness, it's the downcast soul as well as the exuberance and joy and celebration of life it's it's all there um, and so I think w one of the things that is is a blessing to us is to have that expression and to know that many of these psalms were written by David King David and, and scripture tells us that he is a man after God's own heart um, and so we we know that God is um, he was with David um, and so let's take Psalm 23, for example, a psalm that I think many people know, um, that middle portion where he talks about, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, and he, the reason that he says, I will fear no evil is because God is with him, your rod and your staff. Uh, they comfort me, they guide me. Um, but there's just a little expression of a man after God's own heart talking about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, uh, it could be experiencing grief from a loved one dying. It could be um, his life in danger. It could be a struggle with low mood. And, and just like that example of Paul praying for the thorn to be removed in his flesh. We don't know. We don't know what it is, but it, it could be some kind of um, just a, a struggle that we're experiencing. Um, and so if, we, if King David is having these struggles, if, if Paul is having these struggles, I think we can be confident that it is not a, a weakness of faith, <laughs> that, um, that um, it is um, a situation that, we are experiencing and um, uh, just coming back to that reference of uh, of Romans 5 of of suffering producing um, perseverance and perseverance character and character hope that does not disappoint um, there is there is work that God is doing through the suffering and so uh, faith is strengthened um, our trust in the Lord is strengthened and so without things that strengthen our faith or grow our faith, um, I guess we're, 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 going to, we're going to continue to be infants. Um, and so I really, I really would just want to say again, no, an absolute no. It's not a weakness of faith. Um, and I, I'm thinking of one counsellor that I, I have who has struggled with, with low mood, with depression. And I think one of the joys for me is seeing her constantly turning to God in the midst of that. Um, so she's, she will wake up in the morning and she, she, she says to me, I just feel like I can't do anything. I just want to curl up and stay in bed. Um, but God has been helping her to keep turning to him and to, to get out of bed even though she doesn't feel like it um, or that she doesn't have the strength to do that. And, and what a joy it is for me to witness um, not a weakness of faith, but um, incredible faith in trusting God to do the next step of getting out of bed and getting on with the day. Um, so they're just a few thoughts. Um, yeah, but please, please know it's not a weakness of faith because this is something I hear so often or you're not praying hard enough or you're not reading enough scripture. Um, that is not true. 
I just want to add that, uh, you know, there's the Old Testament Elijah, and he did this great uh, miracle, you know, the powerful thing on Mount Carmel where he brought fire from heaven and, you know, uh, uh, it burnt up the sacrifice. And after doing that, and, you know, they killed off all the prophets of Baal. And immediately after that, he runs away. He's fearful for his life and he's very depressed. And sitting under the tree is a classic example of depression there. So the great prophet Elijah was depressed. And the angel had to come and help him and, you know, revive him. So there are examples, plenty of examples from scripture. Thank you, Dr. Usha. Great example. And thank you, Sarah, for the great insights. Um, I, so we've, we've, we've explored the questions of, um, you know, can people with strong faith have mental health conditions? And it seems like the question clearly is yes from, from scripture and also just from everyday life. We've also kind of asked the question, is it a sign of a weak faith? And like that example of the blind man healed, um, probably not. So Scott, um, do you feel like is, uh, is mental health even a spiritual issue? Is this, is this best discussed as a, as a topic that is tightly related to our spiritual lives? Or do you, have you come to view it somewhat differently? You know, that's a very good question. I think that mental health is a spiritual issue, um, just as anything else that we deal with in life is spiritual uh, as well. You know, we're, we're holistic beings. And while it's easy to try to compartmentalize areas of our life, um, in order for us to function as God intends for us to function, we have to look at ourselves in a holistic manner. And that involves both the spiritual aspects of our lives and the um, aspects of our lives that are uh, perhaps emotional or whatever that may be less inclined towards God. But, um, you know, when we, uh, when we look at issues of mental health, you know, one of the things that we sometimes deal with is the issue of, well, you know, can I not get over this just because I don't have enough faith? And uh, Sarah talked to this briefly a second ago. I mentioned it a, a few minutes ago. And, um, you know, it's not always about the spirituality of our situation. And I think we have to, in looking at holistically what's going on, be willing to accept that there's more than just spiritual things at work in our mental health concerns. And so sometimes uh, someone may need to be put on a certain kind of medication to help with depression or anxiety or other things of that nature. And for Christians, I feel like um, many times we think that, oh no, if I have to get medicine for this, I don't have enough faith and therefore I'm not going to get the healing I need. And that's just absolutely not true. Um, God uh, has given great minds the ability to create medical treatments that help us. And I think he expects and allows us to use those helps. Um, for those struggling with depression, sometimes taking some medicine to help get your mind in a place where you can uh, think more clearly so that you can begin to move on and heal from that is an important part of the healing process. And so what, what I would say is, I don't think that it's completely, um, you know, our, none of our struggles are completely devoid of spirituality but they're not solely based on spiritual uh, issues. And as a result, we don't need to shun um, modern medical technology. We don't need to shun medicine. We don't need to shun uh, modern psychological theories or practices. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I only want biblical counseling because the Bible is you know, the book for Christians and it's our guidebook for life. And it is. And everything that the Bible says about mental health or says about um, you know, grief or struggle or suffering or all that stuff is all correct. But the Bible itself is not a textbook on those particular issues. And it doesn't include everything we know now about it. It's just that everything it includes is correct, right? So um, I would just argue that, you know, people don't need to be afraid to, uh, especially when they seek professional help, um, they don't need to be afraid of being prescribed a medication. They don't need to be afraid of hearing about a theory that's not mentioned specifically in the Bible. You know, they don't need to be afraid of, of some kind of a counseling technique or practice 
that is not necessarily mentioned in scripture because while while our mental health issues are spiritual, they're not solely spiritual. And we need to be thinking more about a holistic approach. How can I heal uh, based on everything that I am, not just this one particular aspect of life? Thank you, Dr. Schiffer, very well said. And what you just said segues perfectly into our, our next question. I remember um, Dr. Shook, when I was in college, I, had to, I did not study mental health or psychology, but I did take one psychology class. And I remember it was, it was, it was an interesting class and they, there were some challenging things that the professor dived into, you know, whether it was Sigmund Freud or the, um, just some of the experiments that have been done throughout psychology history. But it, it made me wonder, you know, is psychology a field that, that we should be thinking about? You know, is it, there tends to be sort of this, this um, some people tend to be leery or sort of wary of psychology and how to think about it and, and how much legitimacy it should even have in our public discourse. Do you have, um, do you have any thoughts on if that is a valid bias or a valid suspicion in terms of people's views on, on the field of psychology? Well, we need to understand uh, psychology. It's a relatively new field. And like you said, actually, Sigmund Freud was the father of psychiatry and not psychology per se. So he created his own uh, theory uh, because at that time there was no tools. And actually, Sigmund Freud, has, all his theories, most of them have been debunked. So current uh, psychological practice does not really go back to Freud. Okay, Unfortunately, it is still being taught and people, uh, you know, uh, learn, think that it's the truth, but it's not the truth. In fact, there are so many theories now in psychology that it's very confusing. So one group will say one thing, another group will say another thing. The good thing about psychology is basically it's about you're researching human behavior. And as long as it is describing human behavior in different conditions, you categorize it and you say, okay, these type of symptoms, okay, we call it this name. That's fine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you found the root cause. So in terms of describing human behavior, psychology is fine. But in time, terms of finding the root cause, uh, psychology doesn't have an answer really. Because remember one thing, psychology as a field is developed outside. Um, I mean, it's a secular field. It, the understanding of human beings as spiritual beings, there's no spirituality in psychology at all. And therefore, there's a dimension that is totally being missed. So I would look at psychology. It's very helpful in understanding behavior, but I wouldn't look at psychology for finding root causes, which a lot of times we can find more in uh, spiritual, in, in counseling and scripture, because psychology doesn't know how to deal with guilt. When it comes to forgiveness, for example, psychology won't tell you how to do it. And people struggle with guilt. People, guilt is real because we are made in the image of God and our relationship with God. So God's laws are applicable to all human beings. And that's a whole dimension that psychology does not address. So that's what I would say. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Um, Dr. Raj, we'll, we'll direct this next question to you, sir. There seems to be, we've talked a lot about the stigmas related to psych, to a mental health and psychology and some of the different um, ways those are, those, those make a difference. What about therapy and medication? There, there seems to be specifically a pretty strong taboo in a lot of circles, including Christian circles about seeking therapy or medication for mental health. What, what would you, what would you like to, uh, to kind of shed light on those, those ideas for us? Yeah, this is a very, very important question because um, um, as a psychiatrist, we are helpers. We, we see this, you know, something called pathway of care. What is What that means is uh, someone who is suffering and, and then there is a place of help available, how they are going, reaching this place of help, what are the components involved. And stigma and discrimination um, is, is a major barrier when it comes to mental health, because often, you know, we are talking about people struggling, suffering in silent, even in, in, our, even in our church context. Um, and I think we are we are tracing the theme and encouraging our church to be a, you know, welcoming place. 
uh, in this last one hour. Um, let's. Yeah, many years ago, we were doing a conference um, in in nearby city. It's called. Uh, it was called Christian Response to Mental Health, and one of the professor uh, of a, a college he came and um, he started opening up uh, his about his struggle in the breakout during you know lunchtime. And I asked him um, questions about his life and he shared that he's taking some medicines for his depression. He wants to make sure that it's on a right dose. So we are kind of doing a little mini consultation on the side. Um, but then at the end, uh, he said something. He said, please do not mention this to anyone because uh, uh, my church, my community, my immediate family, no one knows, uh, they, no one know about uh, my depression. That was, um, I know that is the case, but when I heard from a, such a reputed um, college from a professor uh, who's part of a big church and it's, it's you know, his fear was that people would reject him. People would uh, call him Pagal in Hindi, which is means, uh, which means crazy person. So, you know, the, that is, that's a kind of this base uh, thing um, that we need to break in order to talk about uh, taboo of therapy or issue of medicine. Let's let's talk about therapy. You know, uh, when it comes to therapy uh, or counseling or talking therapy, uh, the research shows there are level one evidence. Uh, you know what we call like let's say CBT, um, level one evidence for uh, treating anxiety, depression. So there are a lot of help available. Um, so in some some cases, it was um, uh, you know mentioned as a first line of treatment. But I was talking about this to a pastor um, and he said, uh, Raja, you call this as a counseling, but I call this as a conversational ministry. And he said, you see 20 patients uh, in your, uh, in your you know, consultation room in a day, but I see 200 people in my church every, uh, every week. They're all struggling with various kind of uh, you know, mental health issues. So uh, that word stuck in my mind a lot, like conversational ministry. It's a very simple term. It, it just shows, you know, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, just the well conversation, very casual, but there is addressing suffering, sin, leading to worship, you know, redemption happening. So that is that is where I see uh, the taboo of therapy needs to be broken, even from the language. I think as a church, as a community, we should we should start using languages, uh, you know, not, yeah, of course, we need we need counseling, we need uh, CBT, we need specific those things. But let's start from, you know, loving one another through conversation. Um, and then and then the third issue of, you know, this issue of medi medication. Uh, some people, you know, feel pressure uh, because family members are telling them to take medicine. And, uh, you know, there are some cultural misunderstanding. Um, and then, uh, you know, recently I met a patient and uh, she said whenever she fights with her husband, she has tingling sensation and anxious feeling. She feels like she's going to faint and she would show up in ER and asking for medication or injections. And for her, my, in her mind, uh, I have a symptom and I need medicines, but she's unable to connect those dots. Um, so so we need to take when it comes to medication, uh, we need we need to see the larger context of uh, what it is and uh, how it works and uh, how we can use. In some cases, some people resist medicine. You know, we were talking about this. Dr. Scott uh, touched a little earlier um, that they think it's a less spiritual. Uh, they think taking medicine is if I take medicines, I'm I'm not that spiritual. So I need to kind of you know fight it out. Uh, but in our Christian idea, it's it's not just happening, you know, medicines are no medicine. There is there is kind of this different spectrum of people that we see. Some people, they think it's useful, but they don't know about the effectiveness. Some people, they think may be useful, maybe they can try it out. Some people, they say, you know, uh, taking medicines are against uh, Christian idea. But I found it very helpful from uh, Dr. Mike Emlett. Um, with whom I worked in the past, um, he he says, you know, God's design is to relieve suffering, and um, you know, from from the time of fall. So medications are gift of common grace. And uh, Dr. Scott, uh, you know, talked earlier that God has given wisdom to medical professionals, scientists, and you know, to people to make medicines, uh, but. But it's important that, you know, there are two kingdom agendas here. One is relieve suffering, but 
transformation on the other side. If we just, uh, you know, when I take medicines, if I just stop there, symptom relief, then then I'm not going a little further to see the bigger kingdom agenda uh, as my transformation, uh, what it is at stake there. Um, so we need to encourage the sufferers not to, you know, just to believe in fine tuning the medicines are more important, but also, you know, look the larger picture of, uh, you know, their faith in God and uh, the community interaction, um, even, you know, simple ways to going and doing exercise, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes of walk is as spiritual as, uh, you know, talking to someone. Um, so, uh, but you know, there is a quote that I read recently of this former uh, NIMH. NIMH is our, you know, in US, that's a National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, he was a former director, Stephen Hyman. He said, uh, quote, we psychiatrists have been given an impossible task. Our medicine medications are sometimes able to alleviate symptoms, though they are often come with side effects but we cannot give people what they really need people need meaning and relationship end of the quote that's that just i think he nailed it uh, to capture there is medication yes we need to take but there is this larger story larger picture of meaning and relationship so where do we go from here here is a you know um uh, stigma of mental illness and need for therapy, conversational ministry, the possibility of medications. But overall, for our church, um, we need to, we, we can remember this KAP, knowledge, attitude, practice. We all need to know uh, what is mental illness, what causes them, how we can respond, and we can change our at attitude towards, you know, balanced view of what scripture talks about, illness, suffering, how we all can help not just stop there, but, you know, we are talking about um, uh, how our church can practice this, move towards one another. And um, I remember, uh, again, a, a story of a pastor I know here, he's right now supervising a medication for a man who thinks there are two Bollywood stars that are living in his chest. And he's, of course, he's struggling with the delusions and, and he prays with him. He actually goes out and get antipsychotic medicines for him and he's helping his parents you know um, once in a month he would like call me and give me a report so that's where i see you know this how church the pastor the church can actually come along and break those barriers of taboos and therapies and here is a welcoming place for people to go and be who they are and receive help i just want to add that uh, in india unfortunately psychiatrists over-prescribed because they don't have enough time for counseling or talk therapy. The majority of patients actually require more of counseling rather than medication. But since there is a shortage of counselors and people available to talk to patients, uh, they go to the psychiatrist, psychiatrists will just give drugs. And so they're not, I mean, the drugs are, will make them drowsy. There are side effects. They, um, symptoms will be reduced but the root cause is not addressed in most cases. I think in modern psychiatry, there is a small percentage of uh, patients who really require therapy, like you know, in bipolar and schizophrenia and all that. But the majority of other cases uh, mainly help through supportive therapy, through counseling and talk therapy. You know, you find a very similar situation in the United States as well. Um, most counselors cannot prescribe medication, psychiatrists can. And if you look at a counseling appointment, it's usually an hour to two hours in length. And if you look at a psychiatrist appointment, it's usually 15 minutes to 30 minutes tops. And you essentially go to the psychiatrist, you get a prescription and you leave. And um, if you go to a counselor, they want to help you work things out. So most of the time here, counselors will say, um, you know, something to the effect of, you know, but a medication will help you. I'm going to send you to this psychiatrist, but come back to me because we need to work on your issues while you are on the medication. Uh, but for those that just straight go to you know, go to go to psychiatrists, they miss out on what you're saying is the root cause, and they aren't getting to the the issue. They're just sort of putting a bandaid on over and over again. That's fascinating. 
I wonder at this point, as we just a couple of last questions on this, this uh, second to last section, I wonder if we could bring the ideas of self and self-esteem onto the table for discussion. A lot of modern um, psychologists like to promote this idea of self as being the answer to a lot of mental health, um, a lot of mental health complications. So Raja and then Scott, um, how, how do you think as Christians, we should think about self-esteem? I'm thinking of a well-known C.S. Lewis quote where he says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking about yourself less or something like that. And so there are certain quotes and, and um, ideas about self-esteem, but how do you think the idea of self and self-esteem interact with a biblical view of this holistic spiritual self that we've been dialoguing about? Yeah, that, that's again a very, very important question. And um, um, as as we say, modern psychology, we are not being polemic there. Um, as to, you know, we are we are we are appreciating what the psychology and um, you know the the scientists have brought to the table to help people. So, uh, so there are a lot of similarities. Uh, let's let's. I'm I'm going to just follow this up as a, as a similarities and differences. So one is this, the similarities between modern psychology, you know, and scripture, and both we are both are trying to understand uh, the troubled people, our people in general, uh, who, you know, if we, we call this as epistemological question, you know, <laughs> the knowledge and who, who are we. And then the second important question, uh, both Christianity and modern psychology, both are trying to understand is how do we help? how we can be an effective helper, what are the ways. So they both are interested in this personal stories. And, um, you know, when I sit here in my clinic, um, I don't even ask many of the time to my clients, what is your problem? I usually ask, what's your story? Um, so I want to hear who they are rather than what they are struggling with, because the who what they're struggling is part of that who they are. But even even as we are telling, you know, uh, who are we is a question of the self. Uh, modern psychology, here is, here, is, here is the way, you know, let's start from modern psychology and see how scripture expands that. Modern psychology uses the word self-esteem. You know, we are, we are using, you know, the word self and, and low self-esteem or high self-esteem um, and offers varieties of helpful tips, methodologies to build yourself. It's a focus on you. And uh, the arrow is inward. You know, there is there is a kind of this inward movement. I'm looking into myself, my willpower, my positive thinking. How can I cut down my negative influence? And so, so you start from poor self-esteem, connect those dots and thinking and behaviors, and then you know move towards the increased self-esteem. But that's that's uh, that's what what I see there. But on the other hand, scripture gives a little bit little more broader, richer view. Uh, because it doesn't use the esteem there. It's actually used, so, you know, Dr. Ashok Kelly was telling, we are created in the image of God. So from Genesis uh, throughout scripture, we see this echoes multiple times. So the anchor is on, not on ourself, but the anchor of our emotions uh, and feelings are all put on to God rather than our own self. So it's, it's not inward, it's outward movement. And uh, so we are not talking about self-esteem there. It's a self-image as an image created, uh, you know, in the, in the image of God. So our starting point is different. Where we are anchoring our feelings and emotions are different. And what we are looking as a whole, as a person, rather than, um, you know, we are not just looking at uh, one component of the person. So that is where I feel scripture has more to offer. Uh, here is it's it is like uh, you know a lot of in india we call this you know meal with the multiple things it's color and like a smell and food that's that's what i i see in scripture many years ago i was working in uh, northeastern part of india close to bangladesh border in a, another mission hospital there and i i was treating um, a, a professor um, from a nearby college he was struggling with the depression and he was on antidepressant, you know, we are talking about medication. He was two antidepressants, one sleeping medicine, one vitamin, and a small dose of antipsychotic. That was his, uh, you know, the cocktail prescription that he had. But when we, when, when we started talking, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time together exploring what's going on. And then he started telling 
his low view of himself is coming out of his fear of people and fear of failure what people might say and uh, even he stopped going to college and uh, you know those all those symptoms all put together and then diagnosis was given that that told me what he was suffering but that didn't tell me why he was suffering you know that the, we were talking about the root cause and then one day he he said like i i um i'm i'm not good i i i am not good i need to i need to improve myself my self esteem is not good so i brought this idea of uh you know he's he's from a different faith but we started talking about I, i i told him actually one day you are created in the image of god when i see you i don't see mr x sitting here i see uh, an image of god sitting in front of me uh when i said that he 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 was surprised because he said i never heard in my life that i am i am created in the image of god that that's kind of like you know for him it was a experience out of himself and and that that became the vehicle for healing of his depression that that's a that's a thread that we started tracing throughout those two months when he was you know coming for different talking therapy and medication adjustment and we i actually have have to reduce his medicines and to one antidepressant and we started talking about um, uh, his uh, poor view of self and then the image of god so that is that's a that's where i see scripture comes very practical and it gives um, uh, you know when i see a patient in my clinic i tell them um, i'm seeing an image of god which is better you know as a patient is a better or seeing someone as an image of god is better i think seeing someone as an image of god is better and the scripture in another way it, you know it also shows us you cannot do this on your own uh, looking into you, yourself uh, that is where we call this as a you know rescuing grace where the grace comes to rescue us um the embodiment of jesus that he became the image of the invisible god and he come to us and restores our image you know we are now united with him so all this dots connecting we, we can see our self is you know we don't we don't think this as a everyday thing but the, here is the superior view of man he is created in the image of god i think that's where everything rests when it comes to uh, who we are our self self image and everything to follow up a little bit more on the image of god imagery in scripture uh, there's often times a question that involves what does it mean to be created in the image of god and uh, you've heard different people i'm sure speak about the issue and uh, one of the things they'll often say is well humans are rational and like animals but i mean if you if you watch enough animals you find that some animals are pretty rational beings um they just don't have uh some of the same capacities that we do uh but i think scripture is really more broad than that uh when scripture says we're created in the image of god what it means is we are like god in every way that we reflect god's character and nature and you know god is good god is loving god is compassionate god is gracious god is just god is righteous god is holy um you also find that god is love god is jealous um you know god grieves um there's a a movie that came out a few years ago it's a pixar cartoon film called um oh i think it's called like inside or something like that, inside out whatever it is it's a it's this movie where you got all these emotions right and throughout the whole movie they're trying to push the sadness emotion to the side like don't be sad don't be sad and the the character finally comes into her own when she embraces the sadness and realizes that being sad is an important part of being who she is um as a father i have four daughters and we're trying to uh you know uh, as a parent you know one of your goals as a parent is to produce uh children who will become uh if you will you know responsible contributors of society as responsible adults when they get out of your house right and uh you know i want my girls to be confident i want them to um have good self esteem believe in themselves uh but i don't want them to be vain or conceited and think they're the greatest thing ever right um so i think there's a balance we have to uh sort of find between understanding all of our emotions feeling all of our emotions and uh also finding exactly who we are in god's image another thing i think that's really important in in relation to god's image is that men and women equally are created in the image of god 
Uh, it's not more to one gender than the other. And, uh, you know, in Genesis 1, when it says he created them in his image, it says male and female in his image. And so, um, you know, uh, another thing that I think is important here is recognizing that in the church, we so often talk about how people are sinners. And sometimes we put too much emphasis on the sin. And as a result, people tend to think less about themselves and about their value. But in reality, we are intrinsically valuable because we're created in God's image. And the scripture does say we're sinners, but it also says, while you were still sinners, Christ came to die for you because of how much he loves you. And, uh, you know, God loves us in spite of our sin. And so our value isn't based on the fact that we're sinners. Our value is based on the fact that we're created in the image of God. And when we recognize this, we can say, look, I do sin, but the sin doesn't define who I am. Being created in God's image defines who I am, and I'm valuable even if I've made mistakes. And so as a church, I think we really need to think about how we speak about, you know, hellfire, brimstone, all that kind of stuff, um, not to downplay it, uh, you know, not to uh, say that sin's not an issue, but simply to say that um, as Christians, you know, if Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, that means he forgave all of our sins, past, present, and future. And we don't have to continually think every time we do something wrong, oh no, Christ has to die for me again. No, he, he already did it. He did it once for all. And so as Christians, we need to really work on not uh, presenting this gospel idea uh, that we should always be guilty about everything to the point where we think less of who we are. Uh, instead, uh, we need to recognize that Christ saved us from what we were in. We were in sin. It's not who we, I mean, in, in some sense, you know, sin is who we are, but, um, you know, we were sinful, right? We are sinful, but Christ saves us from that, and our value comes from being created in God's image and being loved by God so much that he sent his son to die for us, um, in spite of the fact that we were making decisions that were outside of his moral will for our lives. Dr. Ashok and Sarah, Scott and Raj just spoke beautifully about how we are made in God's image and, and reminded us of that important truth. I'm, I'm curious how um, the topic of genetic predispositions interacts with that. Is there, have you found there to be any, uh, well, I guess, for example, if I'm struggling with chronic anxiety and, and I, I believe that this is because of my genes and my DNA and I have a genetic tendency toward this, that can be disheartening and, and that can make me feel like I'm in bondage to this condition and, and there is no hope. So I'm, I'm curious how, how Dr. Shoka and then Sarah, would you, um, help somebody better understand what the role of, of predispositions is and how we can understand those um, in light of what Scott and Raja just shared? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question because I think uh, in many years we, are, we have been told uh, that our genetics sort of determine who we are. And that's a false thing. It's a very deterministic view of self, that it's already predetermined. It's, a, it's almost like you don't have a free will. Whereas scripture tells that we are people created in the image of God. Therefore, we can choose our actions. We, it's not inside us. You know, it's not written in our DNA that you're going to act like this. You choose to sin. Your DNA doesn't make you sin also, right? So we are, we are people who are created in the image of God and we have choices. And not only that, the latest science, there's a science of epigenetics, which shows that, again shows that it's the environment plays an effect on, you can change your genes. There's science which has proven that and you can check that out on Google. Uh, there's a guy who called Bruce Lipton who's written a book called The Biology of Belief. And he says how your thoughts can change your predisposition. You don't have to be stuck in that particular frame because we receive something, of course, from our parents, from our environment, from the culture in which we grow up in. But we don't have to, we can choose to be different from what we grew up in. 
And there are many examples of people who have come out of, let's say, poverty and who have done well. So it's your environment doesn't make you do the things that you do. Your genes, what you get from your parents, don't make you do. My genes will tell, you know, I can't change the color of my skin or my hair or my eyes. That's what the genes do. But it can't tell me what to do and how I should act. That is my choice. And we, as we continue with this idea of free will, created in the image of God, because God has actually given man that power to rule over the rest of the earth. That means he has that freedom of choice. And so we are not stuck in those uh, by our genes. I'll hand over to Sarah. Well, I don't think um, I want to say anything more about the genes, but let me just broaden that out a little bit. In I think there are many things that we um, might look to to determine um, how we behave or how we interact. We might blame, for example, because this happened to me in my childhood. This is how I am today. And um, no doubt there are things that shape us. Um, they influence us and we do have um, our strengths and weaknesses. And, and if we are wanting to understand ourselves um, the image of God that we're made in. We want to see ourselves accurately. I think that's a really helpful thing. Like, um, like if you're talking about uh, self-esteem as a, as a concept, you don't want a false sense of who you are. You want to be able to see yourselves accurately. And, and when we do come to that from um, a scriptural perspective, from a Christian worldview, we see that we need God to help us to see ourselves accurately. And we need one another because I can think I'm really good at something. And someone else um, may tell me, actually, Sarah, you're not that good at it. You're not such a good singer. You know, you're not in tune. And I can't tell that because I think I sound really good. Um, or maybe it's the other way around. You think you're really bad at something and someone else says, actually, no, you're, you're quite you're really good at coming alongside people. You, you may say that you don't have anything to say to people, but I see the way that you relate to them. So we have our strengths, our weaknesses, and we need one another to help us see that. Um, but I think one of the, the, like when we have this bigger picture, that's what we've kind of been talking about, when we want to see things from God's perspective, um, we can see that it's not about my abilities anymore to change myself. Like we want to be, doing what we can from our side. But um, if our hope, let me put it that way, if our hope is in our own abilities, we're going to be disappointed again and again and again. And those people who perhaps are a bit more competent or have stronger willpower, they will build, I guess, their confidence in their own abilities. But eventually there'll be something where they get disappointed or they're discouraged by that. Um, and so I think... It is incredibly liberating for us to have this bigger pitch that says the hope doesn't have to come from inside of ourselves. So Raja was mentioning before, like all the ways that we're looking inward, when we start looking outward, um, our perspective changes entirely. And the hope that we read about in Romans 5, Romans 8 and um, 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, all these passages that talk about hope, and there's, there's many more than those passages as well, but they're saying it's not about us anymore. It's not about our ability to change our situation or ourselves. And, and I think when people are struggling, um, particularly with um, things like addictions and so on, where it, it's about your own strength so often, this is just such a liberating and freeing understanding um, that, and we have that bigger picture. And, and so I really just want to kind of carry on. We're talking about genetics, but that there are lots of other things that will say determine our interactions or um, just how we face life. And um, it, it doesn't need to, they are significant, but they're not determinative. Let me let me just quickly add two points um, just come to my mind. When scripture, there is one particular scripture, Ephesians 2, uh, 1, 2, you know, it talks about by nature, uh, we are sons of disobedience. And, and then it takes on further the journey of how we became, uh, you know, moving from there to get life. And then there's another place 
uh, in Galatians and uh, all those letters where Paul says the old self has been crucified from Romans to Galatians if you journey. And there's old self and then there is a new self. And, you know, uh, so the genetics, we cannot uh, put as a deterministic, but we need to see again in this bigger picture of uh, here is a call from moving from, you know, the old, put off the old self, put on the new self. And there is this new, and then Jesus himself, he, he comes, you know, uh, we see in the revelation, there is a new creation, things that are made new. So we, we cannot just say, uh, you know, we will never get out of this. Um, that will be more of an excuse. Uh, and then here is the help comes from outside Jesus and Holy Spirit and continuously renewing our heart. You know, from Jeremiah, we can trace it again. Uh, I will take your heart of, you know, stone and give you heart of flesh. I will do this. So God will uh, do, uh, like he will help us to move beyond all those barriers, the weakness to follow his will and to love him and love one another. Excellent. Thank you all, Raja. Um, we are now going to transition to our last section of questions. We've talked about so far the status quo and then explored what the scriptures say about mental health and then just wrapped up discussing some of these different ideas we encounter in the field of mental health and psychology. Let's transition now and talk specifically about the church and just very practically speaking, how the church can and should respond and, and help people who, um, who are struggling with mental health. Um, Scott and then, uh, and then Dr. Shook, how, um, in your mind's eye, or maybe in the experience you've had with real churches, what would a well-equipped church that is doing a great job navigating these issues of mental health, what would that look like? Yeah, I think that first a church that's going to be equipped to deal with mental health issues has to have a place where people can come to receive counseling. And um, that can be done in one of two ways. Uh, either the church can have a pastor or someone there who works at the church full time to receive people for counseling, or they can have people who are volunteering or who are trained in counseling uh, where they can utilize the church um, to, to meet with people. Um, but I think that in order for that to happen, the church has to have people who are trained to talk to others about their mental health problems. Um, just because someone's a pastor and has the gift of shepherding people doesn't mean the pastor is a good counselor. And um, you know, we, we really need to, to do due diligence in making sure that people have taken uh, training seminars, courses, done their reading, you know, so that they sort of understand some basics of how to help people. And then I think the second thing uh, is uh, that they need to know when it's time to send people to others for help. In other words, people who are counseling in a church setting need to know their limitations, and they need to be willing to say, hey, I think I can help this guy over here, but this, this young lady here, her issue is a bit beyond where I'm at, and I need to be able to refer her to someone else. Um, in America, there are a lot of people that need mental health counseling, they need help, and they cannot afford it. And I think if the church was really interested in helping people, another thing that the church could do to be equipped is to perhaps, perhaps have some funds set aside to help those who need mental health um, to uh, more or less uh, give them the ability to get the help they need when they can't afford it on their own. And um, the, the last thing I would say is that it's a great idea for your churches to also have, um, you know, obviously the church itself is a community, but I think we need to have communities inside the church for people to connect with others who are having some of the similar struggles so that they can build one another up, encourage one another, and help one another along. So I think there's power in having the ability to go and get counseling. I think there's power in having groups of people to walk through your struggles with. And I think there's power in the church being able to um, provide means and resources for people to get the help they need or even send them to others if in fact the people at the specific church aren't equipped to handle someone's situations. Yeah, in India, I'd like to add uh, one or two things is 
first of all, we need to create a safe atmosphere. At the moment, there is still stigma. So people will not talk about mental health. So to, to create that safe atmosphere, it has to start from the top, from the pastor and the leaders, being able to share and talk about it and make it so that people are free to speak about them, knowing that they're not going to be judged, they will be received with grace, and there will be someone to help them. Of course, uh, as Scott says, having counselors, you know, the fact is there are hardly any churches in India where they have trained counselors at all. And most of the pastors also have not been trained in counseling. So they, they usually, uh, you know, they like to pray. Most pastors will pray with uh, persons who come with struggle, but they've not been trained to go down into actually listening well and coming to the root issues and helping them counsel. So there's much more need for training and counseling for pastors as well as lay leaders. That is something that we are actually involved in because we have courses to help uh, lay leaders to be trained in uh, biblical counseling. Uh, the other thing is, you know, to how, how can we really know uh, I would ideally see a church where all the members are divided into cell groups. See, if, if you have a large church, one person can, can never know what's going to happen. In You know, uh, Raj was saying a pastor who had 200 people. You can't handle 200 people, and especially when it's mental health. So if they are divided into cell groups of, say, 10 each, and each of the cell group leaders are trained to care for their people, you can immediately detect when somebody is having a problem. And so the issue can be addressed right in the early stage instead of waiting till he gets into severe depression and so on. So having cell groups and having the leaders trained in biblical counseling will try and prevent that. And the last aspect, I think Scott referred to this, is thing about having support groups. Support groups always help. And uh, we don't have that in India, really. So like if there are two or three people who are, let's say, who have lost uh, their loved ones during uh, COVID. If you had a support group for them, you know, that would really help. I mean, you can help with the funeral and all that sort of thing, but having a group to talk and to listen to one another, it really helps them to overcome grief also. Thank you, Dr. Shuk. Dr. Raj, let, let's say, as Dr. Shuk recommended, let's say someone watching today has involvement in small groups and has many close um, accountability relationships. What are some of the specific signs and um, evidence points you would tell them to watch for in, in terms of if somebody is grappling with some mental illness? Are there any specific things that help identify um, um, some of those struggles? Of course, um, uh, and there, are, there are a lot, but uh, we'll just talk about just the basic things where uh, we can help um, others. You know, there are two things. One is uh, one is this, uh, like the sign, and uh, which means uh, that they we, we are going to we are going to see that that's what they are going through, uh, and then the symptoms they are going to present with they are going to tell us. So so there are two important ways that we can uh, come and identify uh, people who are struggling with mental health issues. In in the symptoms, we can we can see you know uh, we were talking about these embodied souls like so. A simple simple example that I give to my patients often is you know you have a stress in your heart in your soul, and uh, but you have a headache in your body. So so don't just look uh, something uh, you know mind related symptoms, but look broader. Um, so if, you know some of the physical symptoms like tiredness. Um, in India, um, sixty three percent of our outpatient department. Um, where people come with unexplained physical symptoms or struggling with anxiety because here anxiety is expressed as pain. So, you know, pain and tiredness, uh, pounding heart and um, sleep disturbance and stomach ache, even um, loss of appetite, loss of, uh, you know, um, uh, weight, uh, all those things, loss of energy is a quite a common uh, symptom. And... Um, um, so, so if, if you put in categories, uh, think of this way, like physical symptoms, feeling symptoms, thinking symptoms and behavior symptoms and imagining symptoms. So in feelings, you know, sadness, again, again, unusual sadness. That's what we are talking about here. Um, I use simple uh, things uh, to remember like a helplessness when it comes to depression, it's all less lessness. 
helplessness hopelessness worthlessness feeling lifelessness i know sleeplessness so when someone is going through this more than 2 3 weeks non stop and um, they are also crying they are also you look at them they are sad they are withdrawn then maybe maybe this person might be you know going through uh, uh depression so so how about start talking to them and maybe see whether they need further help uh, and then in the thinking we can see you know thoughts of suicide it's a very important topic um uh to to identify and you know assess the risk of someone uh, whether they are just talking about suicidal ideation or they have made plans um so uh, you know uh, it is very important to uh, get to that level of asking those questions important question of hey are you are you are you thinking contemplating uh, whether your life is worthless are you planning to take your life uh, is uh, what what are you thinking about so uh, analyzing that and then the behaviors you know if someone is crying uh you know we are talking about schizophrenia talking to self um all those things are part of uh, severe mental health issues uh, um, and then the imagining symptoms are mostly in the severe mental health issues like false belief hearing voices um you know uh, seeing things which are not there smelling things which are not there um feeling things you know what we call tactile hallucination so if you have to kind of think in um you know maybe five things one is the dramatic change in eating and sleeping pattern um social withdrawal um and then extreme change in moods um and then long lasting sadness someone is kind of going through for a long period of time and then you know paranoia worry and anxiety so that that will be helpful for us to identify but uh, but in the in our church context i would i would just say uh, you know uh, just add to that is uh i recently heard a pastor giving a speech on mental illness he said a psychiatric diagnosis means uh, ministry opportunities that's what that's what he th he's thinking he's not thinking oh my gosh i don't know this i don't know that or, or you know that that's a quite a common thing to have all those fears lack of fear of lack of knowledge or awareness that's where scott and dr um, ashok was telling you know uh, getting trained is very important so uh, for us for a church psychiatric diagnosis means uh, mental illness or ministry opportunities we are that means we are not waiting for them to come to us we are going to move towards them that's an another way i think as a response to that uh, listen to what uh, ed well says he says people with the difficult psychiatric problems are in every church and we hope their numbers will increase uh, let's see what he says we hope this happens because it would mean that our churches are both inviting and helpful helpful the challenge is that neither inviting nor helpful happens naturally when those needing help have problems that are especially hard to understand so so the first step is to move towards understand and then ordinary people uh, you know other other ways that we think is you know we are i'm a lay leader or i'm a small group church member um i'm a teacher um but but the the common thing is the ordinary people are the best helpers you know as i was telling uh, one of our pastor story who brought uh, the woman with uh, uh, postpartum psychosis um and i i am very closely related to a church in us where they call this as a casserole ministry that when someone is depressed uh, or you know going through depression they would take them casserole and uh, help with their child care and uh, even there is a team in their church where they would take them for a doctor's appointment because you know other family members are working they they act as a social service so that is where i am kind of seeing uh, you know if you have to remember a story uh, for all these things um i would i would go to a samaritan good samaritan story where everything that what he did i i actually studied that uh, verb by verb you know samaritan came he saw he felt he going near to him and uh, you know soothing his wound taking care of him so uh, that is what we need to do if we, if you have to remember one thing uh, we identify we equip ourselves get trained and we move towards the person who is suffering i think that that moment is where i am encouraging all of us here listeners to follow excellent very well said raja thank you 
we have uh, just two questions remaining. And this, ne this uh, next to last question will go to, uh, to Scott and then Dr. Ashok. Um, we've been reminded today of how widespread mental health conditions are and how many millions and millions and millions of people suffer from mental health. Let's talk for a moment just about church leaders and, and maybe not just specifically pastors, but maybe people who are involved in women's Bible studies or who are deacons or who are involved in various aspects of leadership and responsibility. If, you know, church leaders are supposed to have all the answers and be the ones helping others, where, where can they turn if they themselves are struggling with, with mental health issues? Yeah, you know, this is a very good question. Here in the United States over the last several years, three prominent pastors committed suicide and all of them had been struggling with depression. And it was, uh, for, for all of these pastors, it was known that they were having struggles, so they hadn't been hiding it. Um, but it's very clear that people in ministry do have mental health problems. And um, in fact, uh, in studies that I've seen, lots of pastors that don't have people to talk to, don't get counseling, end up getting burned out in ministry. And at some point, you know, leaving ministry altogether because of all the struggles that accompany it. You know, if you are in leadership as a deacon or as a pastor or as a Bible study teacher, you're in essence opening yourself up to uh, hearing about other people's problems and their situations and walking through those with them. And sometimes you may begin to feel like no one's there to walk through your situation. And as a result, people tend to take on and take on and take on all of everybody else's issues, but if they don't have somewhere to take their own issues and sort of, um, you know, work those out, they, they get burned out pretty easily. And so I am a big advocate for uh, counseling, and I encourage pastors to get counseling. I go to counseling on occasion, and uh, you know, there's been times where I've had specific issues and things happen in life where I've needed counseling. Uh, a number of years ago, my mother was diagnosed with um, colon and liver cancer, and so uh, I went to counseling throughout that process, and uh, that allowed me to sort of help work through a lot of issues related to, uh, you know, her coming to the end of her life, and, and um, you know, it's important for, for leaders to get counseling, and so uh, I think that sometimes they do think, you know, I'm the leader, I've got to have all this figured out. The thing is that nobody has it all figured out, you know, nobody has all the answers, and we're all human. Uh, in Christ, uh, we are all equally saved. We're all, uh, you know, he said that shed the same blood for all of us, and in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile or, you know, slave or free or whatever. I mean, it, it's all, you know, the playing field is equal in the faith, and in reality, uh, different people have different spiritual gifts, but just because your gift is in pastoral leadership or uh, in teaching or whatever else, it doesn't mean you're no longer susceptible to certain issues that everyone else is susceptible to. We're all human. We all face the same kind of issues. So we just need to, um, if, if you will, just kind of get over our position and realize that we all are in need of help, at least on occasion. And it's important for us to seek counseling when we need it. Um, and that helps keep getting, keeps people from getting burned out. It also helps keep people keep from uh, taking on too much responsibility. Sometimes a counselor may say, hey, you know, the reason you're struggling here is because you said yes to 15 things. You got to say no on occasion. And so uh, it, it's very important. And I, I think that leaders need to humble themselves enough to know when they need help and be willing to get it. Yeah, exactly what Scott says is true. Uh, they need to be open and to be vulnerable. And I often talk about Jesus' example. If you go through the Gospels, you'll find whenever he was going through distress, it is recorded there. He was in distress or he was troubled, deeply troubled, or he was angry. How did they know this? The Gospel writers know the emotions of Jesus because he was expressing it to them. And he had his own support group. He used to take Peter, James, and John together to share. When he went to Gethsemane, he said, you come and pray with me. I need your support. If Jesus needed support of human beings, how much more us, you know, uh, leaders? And so, you know, having a support group, it could be other pastors or other leaders. 
we have to break this barrier which prevents us from talking to one another and be open to humbly receiving from one another and that is something that scripture encourages to love one another bear with one another forgive one another encourage one another the one another part of scripture is so much there and if pastors could also do that and model it how much more the church will also start modeling the same thing thank you scott and dr shuk in our final question this one goes to sarah in our last few minutes um Sarah, how would you say, how can parents and friends and churches walk with those who do suffer from mental health issues? Okay, it's, um, it's in many ways a big question, but such an important question. I'm so glad it's been asked. Um, when I first started working, um, after I'd studied psychology as a counselor, mainly with children and families, working with a lot of vulnerable families, um, the biggest I guess the biggest issue in many ways was the social isolation that these families had. They had, there were maybe some people with um, diagnosis um, that made life difficult and so on. But, you know, the biggest thing was the social isolation that there was no community or family support. So don't think that just because you're not trained professionally that you have nothing to offer. Um, there is so much about being, um, being that community, we talked about the body of Christ and the way that we, we are both, we're, we're in. And so like if someone is withdrawing, like there's a responsibility of pulling back into the body as well as moving, moving toward the person who's, who's pulling away. Um, and so there's, I think uh, we help one another remember. I think that's one of the first things I wanna say. We help one another remember because in our struggles, we forget. And when we're talking about a, a Christian understanding, we functionally forget that Jesus loves us. We functionally forget that his grace is sufficient. And it's not like we might be able to say these things with our mouths, but we're not really believing them or we're not in that place of, of resting in that understanding. And we need one another to help us remember these things, to, to help us lift our eyes because we tend to go inward when we're struggling. Um, now, we talked a lot about the complex, um, more complex mental health struggles that people have today. But I just want to point out that the majority of people I meet with for counselling, it's relational struggles. It's work stress. It's not high anxiety, but it's just anxiety that's there or lowness of mood that has been there not necessarily for years but just for a, a more prolonged period of time like a couple of months and so um, we, we want to be I guess ministering to one another across all of these spectrums helping us to remember I was talking to a counsellor just this week actually um, she is single she's studying at college and she's been doing pretty well. That's what, that's what she said. I've been doing pretty well, Sarah, but I just don't know what to do now. And there was loneliness, how much isolation there is, particularly for singles during this season of COVID, um, not able to meet up and all those kind of things. And I think it was about us sharing of what was going on um, and, and being able to share that in life. Now, she did have some good fellowship that was taking place in different um, groups of people that she was in touch with, but they weren't nearby. So I think that was that was one of the things. But but a really big factor was that those times of interaction where you're just hanging out have been removed. Those times where you're having chai together or coffee together or a meal together or just spending time where you may end up sharing something that you wouldn't share unless you had that time. And so just that real importance of being with one another. And I would say in this season, being creative in how you hang out because it's online. And for people when they're living on their own, um, there's, there's no one else to interact with. Um, and that must be so, so, so difficult. Um, the other thing I think to remember, particularly with the more complex mental health struggles, is that it's, mar it's marathon work. It is not something that you can do just for a week or a month or so on, but we need more people 
so that we are helping one another together. Like this kind of love that we've heard about, um, that, that church community that came around, that family that was the, the mother was struggling with postpartum depression, um, that required a whole church community. It wasn't just one or two people. And so realizing that we just need to, to keep um, looking out, I think, looking out for where there is need and, and trusting that God will keep giving us the strength to love because in our, in our strength to love, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to it's not going to last. But we're not, we're not filled by ourselves. We're filled by God's love that overflows. Um, and so I think that's just maybe a, a good kind of note to end on that it, it's not us, it's God through us. And we really, we want people to see that this is God's work, that it's his love and, and not us. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Beautifully said. That is a great note to end on. I know we are... Uh... We, well, just first of all, thank you all. Thank you to each of you who uh, shared, each of our panelists. Thank you to everyone who's watching today. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Shook and Sarah and Dr. Schiffer and Dr. Raj. It was a really wonderful discussion, very timely, very insightful, very eye-opening. Um, before we begin to, before we officially wrap things up, are there any last parting shots that were on your mind that you wanted to share before we, before we end the call? Well, I'll just like to share for the sake of people in India that we have Zoom training available for those who want from churches uh, to enable you to first understand human behavior from a biblical perspective and how to be an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. Uh, and each, uh, we, we do like two hours per day on alternate days. And the one, one module is will take you about a month. And uh, there are about four modules which will help you, at least the basic understanding you have, where you can start actually reaching out to other people. My, my closing, um, I, I want to encourage, um, I think it's a very important topic that we discussed and uh, there is, uh, we took a complex issue and, uh, and talked through the, you know, the lens of scripture um, and and let us let us go and practice. And maybe if you you know if you're in India um, with the COVID second wave and a lot of people are in isolation. If you're a church pastor or a uh, you know um, you're a church member, feel free to you know check in with people. Just maybe if someone is not uh, have not spoken to you, give them a call. Um, maybe send them a text. Send them a fa Facebook message and tell them that you are praying for them and please pray for them. And um, we are all in this together. Um, so I just want to encourage uh, ordinary people are the best helpers. And we are all, we are all those ordinary people, uh, wise, um, uh, you know, counselors uh, filled with uh, God's Holy Spirit. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's been made abundantly clear today that there's a large need for counselors, uh, counselors in India, counselors in America. My guess is probably counselors everywhere else. And so if you watch this and you feel that God may be putting on your heart that that's a ministry that you should look into going into, uh, think about getting training, getting professionally trained. Um, you know, I know if you're here in Texas, you know, our college has a great program uh, in counseling ministries. We have two tracks, a license track because in Texas, there's a state licensure requirements for counseling. But there's also a counseling ministries track, which prepares people to counsel more from scripture and from a church setting without having to become fully licensed. Um, but uh, my guess is that uh, wherever you're at, you should be able to find somewhere that can train you. But if you feel called to counseling ministry, it's a great, it's a great thing to go into and it's, it's a significant need in our culture. It's a great way to take the kingdom of God to people. And so if you feel called to it, look into getting the proper training wherever you're at so that you can uh, begin to walk with the Lord down that road. Perfect. Very well said. Well, thank you all again for your time. Uh, thank you to each of our panelists. Um, uh, thank you to everyone with But God blog who made this possible, all the behind the scenes work and everyone watching it today and, and in the future. We appreciate each one of you. Um, just 
so encouraging to have a discussion like this where we can hopefully be better equipped to help navigate, help people navigate and help navigate ourselves these difficult issues and this important topic of mental health. I think um, here in a second, Sarah's going to close us out in prayer, but I just wanted to share a parting shot from uh, from Hebrews 6. I know we've, we've talked about the Psalms and Ephesians and John, a lot of great passages. I just thought of this verse in Hebrews where the author is talking about the certainty of God's promises and salvation. And he says, so that we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We've been reminded today of how difficult life can be and how there are some very important, real issues that so many people struggle with, millions of people struggle with. And I'm just encouraged zooming out and re remembering that that is ultimately the story of Christianity. The story of the gospel is a story of redemption. And there are so many faiths that, that talk about, you know, just it's all about self-improvement or climbing up to God. But the beauty of the gospel is that he came down to us, that God became man. He experienced, like we talked about, he experienced what it's like to be a man, what it's like to be hungry and to be sorrowful and to experience emotions. And so he's, he's walked a mile in our shoes, so to speak, and even more so than that, going to the cross. So I'm so encouraged by the hope that we have in Christ and the fact that it's not based ultimately on our ability to solve our problems and to, um, to, uh, to improve ourselves, but it's based on his work. And, uh, and all that, we have so many examples in scripture of just broken people, just like ourselves, whether it was David or Paul or Elijah, like you said, Dr. Shug, just so many people who are just as imperfect and broken as us, and yet God redeemed them and worked through them as well. So, um, uh, Sarah, do you want to wrap up our time with a word of prayer? Yeah, I'd love to. Let me Thank pray you. for us. Our Heavenly Father, we, we come to you and we are so grateful uh, to know that you have come near, that in love you gave yourself, that we would have this hope that we have been talking about, a hope that is beyond us, a hope that is sure, a hope that we can be confident in. And so, Heavenly Father, we come and we ask that you would help us as we walk together because you have called us not to walk alone but to walk together that we would we would ask one another how are you doing that we would be really meaning it when we ask it that we would want to understand our each one another's situations that we would want to feel with one another that we would um, be able to remind one another of things that we forget that we have talked about this evening and we thank you heavenly father that um, in many ways uh, you have given us opportunities um, that uh, we that surprise us through uh, through online platforms. So we just want to thank you for the way that you have used But God to bring together this evening's um, time together, and also uh, just to be a place to ask questions um, and to know that we can um, we can seek your wisdom, and your wisdom is for all of life. And we thank you for the experiences you've given each one of us that we have been able to share. And we ask and pray that it would be uh, of help, that it would, be, um, it would be used for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.